Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kit Franklin. I'm the current president-elect of Viagri, and I'd like to thank you for joining us for our June presentation. Um, I'd like to welcome Dr. Richard Earle, to, who is the MD for PSD Agronomy and TGMS Sports Surface Consultants. Richard's lecture today is going to take us through sports pitch design and construction, covering basic soil, water, and agronomic principles, types of grass, and the selection of uh, and a selection of recent case studies as well. As usually, uh, we would like everyone to remain muted throughout the lecture, and uh, we'd like to ask people to put questions in the chat, uh, and then at the end, um, we'll uh, get Richard to maybe look through some of those questions. Uh, with that, I'll pass over to Richard. Well, thanks very much, Kit. Um, I've already seen quite a few familiar faces there, and we've got quite a few more um, along the top there. Uh, for those that don't know me, I'm, I'm Richard Earle. I'm, I'm an agriculture engineer. I originally started off uh, doing an HND at Harper Adams. I think it was 1980 I, I turned up there. Uh, I then did a master's degree and became a member of staff down at Salso College and a, and a PhD. Um, was academic there for quite some time until I joined the dark side in uh, 2002. Um, I joined um, a consultancy practice called uh, Turf Tracks Ground Management Systems Limited, which is TGMS for short. Uh, I got the opportunity to buy it in 2008, actually, and ran it for 11 years and then sold it in 2019 to our competitors, PSD, which is Professional Sports Turf Design. But as part of the deal, I was tied in for five years, which kind of expired at Christmas time this, this, this year. Um, I was supposed to be taking up golf, doing gardening and things like that. Um, but uh, unbeknown to us all, the managing director decided to leave. I was approached, and so I, I've now become managing director of the company I sold and the company I bought. So I said I'd give them another four years, final roll of the dice. So that's that's kind of my history. Um, I've been asked to speak to you about sports pitch design and construction. So let me just uh, get the presentation going. So, yes, um, what I'd like to do is... Uh, split it into sort of three sections. I think I've got about 40 minutes with you. Uh, so I'm going to go through some basic soil and water principles, but, you know, I'm appreciating that some of you are sort of more mechanical agriculture engineers. Others like me are more soily. So I'll, I'll assume no prior knowledge, but um, go through some of those principles and then look at the implications of those principles for sports pitch design. So it's a, I appreciate it's, it's a sort of, um, less agricultural discipline you know within our professional body um but it does in it does sort of contain soil water agronomy and, and a lot of the principles that we apply to agriculture as well and then uh, i think it said i was going to do an array of case studies but i think i've only got 40 minutes so what i'm going to do is just talk you through one of them which is a recent one at whitgift school in surrey um and i'll talk about the approach to it and then just run you through the construction phase, um, how you get from a muddy pitch to a pristine one. So I think without further ado, um, I'll go into some basic principles, in particular looking at plant and soil environment engineering. Now, we used to run a Master of Science degree in this for a whole year, so you know, 40 minutes, you're not going to get very much out of me, but um, I'll, I'll give you a sort of a basic flavour. So soils, we, we tend to... Um, classify them in terms of particle sizes. Um, and there are three main sizes that we, we talk about. Uh, I don't want to go into any great detail here, but basically the big bits are the sand, uh, the intermediate bits are the silt, and then we've got the clay particles. So sands can go anything up to about two millimeters. So for coarse sand, think granulated sugar. Uh, our silts, these are actually the difficult particles. Um, think sort of custard powder, icing sugar. They're kind of um, not as small as clays, but but they're big enough to sort of mobilize and block pores in soils that are associated with aeration and drainage. And then we have the clays, which are really small, but they're fascinating particles, actually. Um, they're, they're kind of little plates. Um, predominantly, they're silica um, and alumina, or silica and aluminium. In fact, the most common ones would have a silica layer some 
bonded water and aluminium or alumina, another bonded bit of water and then silica again. So they've got chemically bonded water, which is important because it allows other water in and nutrients and out again. So I think you might have seen that clay soils tend to shrink when they dry. That's because the other water's gone and you're just down to your chemically bonded water. But they'll also swell up. And in fact, some some clays can swell to 30 percent of their volume um, when they're saturated. So to give you a bit of context, if we take a coarse grain of sand, they're very rarely that shape, but uh, if we assume that's two millimetres, um, a fine grain of sand could look like that in proportion. So we have to be very careful about selecting our, our sands actually for sports pitch construction. You can select a sand which is associated with good drainage and you find that your pitch doesn't drain. Uh, you could get something like 8,000 of these fine grains of sand in the volume of a coarse grain of sand. So they're very fine. Uh, but then we go on to our silts, which are finer still. And then this isn't to um, scale at all, but coming up from the bottom, I don't know whether you can see my little clay particle appearing. Um, to give you some context, if that clay particle was an inch in old money in thickness, say, size of my hand, then the diameter of a coarse grain of sand would be something like 125 meters, you know, like a, you know, like a tower block up there. So you get, you know, trillions of these clay particles, you know, to a to a sand particle, um, which means these clay particles are very important. They're very reactive. They have a huge surface area and they've got this ability to um, supply water, retain water and nutrients. So those are the three main particles, but of course, you don't just get them sort of in those sizes, you get a, a whole mix. Um, and I used to work for the um, Salt Survey of England and Wales, and we go around England and Wales with our augers, um, classifying the soil types around the country. Um, and to do that, we use something called a, a textural triangle. Um, I don't want to go into any great detail, but Along the left side, we start at 0% clay all the way up to 100% clay. Uh, then on the right hand side here, we start at 0% silt down to 100%. And then along the bottom, we start at 0% sand all the way to 100% sand. And so when you analyze your soil, you break it up into the percentage sand, silt and clay, and you can use the textural triangle uh, to meet in the middle. So it's always got to add up to 100. Um, but Interesting points are, for example, you can see a lot of red here. Um, even if you're sort of 40% clay coming across here, generally that soil will be called a clay. You know, even if it's got less than half clay particles because they influence it so much. For sports pitch construction, we really want to be down in the sort of green areas here, uh, sandy loams, loamy sands and sands. Um, so because they're associated with good drainage and reasonable retention of nutrients uh, and water movement. So going back to the Soil Survey of England and Wales, um, a lot of us went around the country on a, well, started off on a five kilometer grid sampling soils and analyzing them. And what you can see from here is you've got all your sort of textual classes down here, but it's a very red picture across England and Wales. Um, you've got a little bit of the greens that we want sort of in Norfolk, Suffolk, uh, quite a bit in Lancashire. Uh, where I'm working at the moment, um, but predominantly you're looking at reds. So you're sort of silty clays, clays, clay loams. So what it does mean is actually naturally most of the soils, the indigenous soils that we have here, will need some help to drain effectively. So quite often if we're designing a sports pitch that someone wants to get winter use out of, we'll need to put in some form of drainage system. So looking at the influence of that on water movement, um, it's quite a complex thing we're trying to do here with a sports pitch. Uh, at the end of the day, we're trying to create an environment within which a living organism will thrive, you know, a grass plant. Um, looking at the water movement, you'll, you'll have um, precipitation, rain coming down here. Um, you might get some surface runoff. Uh, you, get, you get percolation through the, so uh, the soil profile. There may well be cracks and fissures. We talked about craze, uh, clays shrinking. So you might get bypass flow down there. Um, the plant itself will transpire. So you get water movement through the leaves and out through transpiration. 
You'll also get on drying evaporation from the surface. So we call this evapotranspiration. Um, if you carry on down, and actually, apart from sports pitches, I spend a lot of time designing cemeteries these days. So I have to understand um, the hydrogeology, if you like, what's going on with water movement in the geology below. And so if you go down, depending on where you are, you're likely to hit a water table of some sort, groundwater. It could be a true water table or it could be something like a perch water table sitting on an impermeable layer or slowly permeable layer. And then you'll have an unsaturated zone. So um, it's a very transient situation that you're trying to manage in order to have sufficient aeration, but also a, a sufficient water availability and nutrients for the grass to thrive. So you get that emerald green pitch that, look, that looks wonderful on television. So coming on to surface area and pore space, I, I kind of sort of hinted at clays having quite a bit of that. I mean, if we take a block of soil, you just have to go with me on this one. They're not normally it's a cube, cuboid like that. Uh, but you've got a certain area, you've got six sides to that. Um, if you were to split it up, you get a fair old increase in surface area. You know, in each cut face here, you've got more faces. And then you can do the same thing again. So the point is, as you go down in soil textural size, you get a massive increase in surface area, which is important for things like... Um, Place have something called a cation exchange capacity, but it's important for nutrients that can lock on and be released, plus moisture holding capacity. So if I were to take a, a teaspoon of clay, um, maybe four grams in there, the surface area of the soil in that teaspoon might surprise you. You know, if you take those particles out, sort of lay them on the table, you can have the underneath as well as the top for your surface area. It would be something between 80 and 320 square meters from that one little teaspoon. So you can see very reactive stuff. So looking at the influence of that on water movement, I don't want to go into any great detail, but there's a chap called Darcy um, in 1856, I recall, um, who was playing around with lumps of soil. And what he was doing was squirting water through it. He was putting a bit of a head, a bit of a pressure through it through a length of that soil, and then looking at the flow rate, the Q, the volumetric flow rate he was getting through it. And what he found was the rate at which water goes through soil um, is proportional to the um, pressure gradient, if you like, the, uh, the kind of head and the length of it. So that proportionality we call hydraulic conductivity. So one of the, one of the first things we'll do with a soil if we're specking it for a pitch is to get it in the lab and have a look at its hydraulic conductivity. And there'll be a range that we're looking for for certain pitch constructions. So with that in mind, I've got a sand tank here. I filled it with coarse sand. So this is kind of up to two millimeters. Put a little bit of dye on the surface and I've, I've got a raindrop going on to it now. And um, it's fairly intuitive. As you'd imagine, the water hits the dye and you can see that the, the water moves through the soil profile with gravity sort of vertically. So gravity being the main thing pulling that down. But it's not always that say, uh, straightforward. Um, we have something called capillary rise. Now, if you were to get a little dish of water and put in some capillary tubes of varying diameters, what you'll notice is with a wide one, water goes up it a little bit. If you put a, a narrow one in it, it climbs quite high and it, it's very significant. Um, we'll forget about the formula here, but we've got, we've got two things happening here. We've got, we've got the water molecules wanting to adhere to the sides of the tube and kind of climb and try and stick to it. And it does it in soils. It wants to adhere to the, the soil particles. Um, but then countering that, we've actually got the surface here um, which is a sort of chain of water molecules, sort of under tension. You might have heard the phrase surface tension. And so it can climb so high until it can no longer hold on to that surface tension. So it kind of regulates how far it goes. Um, so that's kind of quite important to us in soils. So uh, what's happened here? Oh, yeah, we've got adhesion. That's right. So adhesion up the, up the tube. And then we've got cohesion along the top here. So when we pick a soil, um, 
I actually was the designer for the new Wembley uh, and we did a lot of this testing in the lab at Silso actually but I wasn't allowed to say because we were um, we were sort of sworn to secrecy um, but what we were doing was selecting different sands putting them into the water and then measuring the capillary rise you know it is quite significant um you know talking 160 millimeters you know over six inches and in old old money um people have got this totally wrong by the way with finer finer sands um they've got it such that the capillary rise is actually higher than the pitch itself um so you get a lovely green pitch but it's not grass it's algae um you know and it, you know if you don't understand these basic principles then you can come unstuck so if you've got a water supply below, you've got this kind of, you might have drainage down, but you've got this wicking effect, this capillary rise occurring. I don't normally get ducks like that, but you can see the point. You've got to get it right. Otherwise you've got conditions at the surface that you might not want. So if we look at a, a different scenario now in a glass sided tank, we've got fine sand, over coarse sand, um, and some dye here, and I'm dripping some water. What, what happens then is the water goes in and it gets pulled sideways, mainly through adhesion sideways. Um, but you can see it's hell bent on not going into the coarse sand below. So it's, it's counterintuitive. So you think, you know, you, you want to get some nice coarse material down and it will get through the fine and then off it will go. But it, it doesn't at all. Um, you get this sort of interface and then completely dry soil below. So it's, it's really important to um, understand that principle. And it comes back to water itself as to what's going on here. So water is uh, H2O. So I, I've got some water here. Um, we've got you know, a couple of hydrogens and oxygen. Um, and they kind of arrange themselves so they've got a sort of positive and a negative end. So what that means is that they can then have a, quite a weak bond to another molecule. Uh, it's like sort of magnets, if you like. Um, so they, they kind of hold together in that form and arrange themselves such that they can do that. So then if down here we look at, that's a drip of water. So inside the drip, you've got lots of those um, water molecules all sort of clinging together with their hydrogen bonds, as we call them. But along this edge, on this drip, you've got the, the last line of defense here. They're sort of clinging to each other in tension. They're pulling, and that's what we call surface tension. And that's really what's been going on with the fine over coarse soil. So if we look at this, we'll ignore the formula, but um, and ignore the fact that it looks like a pair of underpants. That's supposed to be two sand particles and a drip of water coming through it. Um, so this is our surface tension down here. Um, and it depends on how far apart these particles are as to how long that can be held on to. If they're too far apart, that will drip through under gravity. In fact, there's a very significant sort of pore size that holds on to water against gravity, and it's um, it's around 60 microns. Um, you can see it. If you want to know what 60 microns looks like, take a millimeter, uh, divide it up into a thousand, and then collect 60 of them. I'm not suggesting you should do that, but you can see that. That's the size that um, a pore that would retain water against gravity. In fact, you get them in sponges, for example, sit in the bath, fill your sponge up with water, lift it out, a bit of water will drain, but the rest of the water is in the sponge because um, you've got a load of pores greater than, uh, sorry, uh, smaller than 60 microns. You squeeze the sponge, a little water comes out. So this has implications for drainage. Um, in the past, there have been quite a few drainage designs like this. Um, dig a trench, put a load of coarse aggregate in, pop your soil back, and that should do it, shouldn't it, really? But what you can actually see is the water sort of coming down slowly through the finer material. Once it gets to your drain, it kind of circumvents it. It does not want to go into the big pores because of surface tension. Uh, and in fact, I frequently come across drainage design like, designs like this. Um, this will be a fairly typical design. So you've got a, the blue is a corrugated, perforated pipe. Uh, in a trench, back filled with gravel, that, that's all fine. Uh, then some sand on top. Got to be a bit careful how much sand you have. You want more rather than less because you're starting to get this sort of hydraulic barrier here. And then quite often, this is a golf course, they'll turf over the top. 
but you know the turf's been grown on finer soil so it doesn't rain at all i mean the, the drain's in perfect condition because no no water's ever been through it in fact when i dug this hole i don't know whether you can see the water sort of come out from the turf round and down into the trench that way rather than go down through the drain so um you know it's important to understand these principles when designing and installing drainage systems so coming on to design um we have different designs for different applications um we do a lot of um uh, work on premiership pitches um and in fact i signed the contract this morning for the FIFA World Cup in the States for the 1920, oh, sorry, 20, 2026, 1926, that's my Austin 7 we were talking about earlier, 2026, where we're going to be managing over 100 pitches there. So we'll be bringing a lot of those up to, to standard. So for that kind of high elite level, that would be a, a typical pitch profile. Uh, so you'd have a perforated drain in a trench, you'll have gravel backfill, Sometimes you'd have something called a blinding layer. That's just sort of like grit, simply to stop finer stuff above it falling through. And um, we do some bridging tests to make sure that it does that. And then the sort of upper profile is often half sand and then half, we call it root zone. It's, it's a sand and a proportion of soil mixed. We call them 90-10s, 70-30s, so it'd be 70% sand, 30% soil. It's a bit of a strange system. I, I've never got my head around it because the soil could be a clay soil, it could be a sand soil, so it's, it's not particularly good. But that's why you need to do some very in-depth testing of the mix of the root zone before you do it. We're just finishing off um, at Chartman Athletic at the moment today, and, and we've been um, the last two weeks testing the stuff that's coming in because once it's done, if you got the mix wrong, uh, you could regret that. So that would be a typical profile. Uh, when it rains or when you irrigate, then this happens. Water comes, it hits this sort of grit layer. And for the reasons that we've discussed a few minutes ago, you have this um, surface tension effect. And so it doesn't go into the gravel below. But this is done intentionally. Um, this is called a suspended water table design. Uh, the reason being, you. For these elite uh, situations, you want really good drainage because you want the game always to be on. Um, typically, you might want, in fact, for the Wembley one I discussed, it had to drain at 100 millimetres an hour when first built and not drop ever to below 20 millimetres an hour. Give you a bit of context around here in Bedfordshire, our sort of monthly rainfall would be around sort of 60 millimetres an hour, something of that ilk. So should be able to take more than a month's rainfall in an hour uh, hence you never see the sort of muddy pitches and things that we kind of remember from the 1970s and 80s now um, but the interesting thing about this is you you build up this water table but if you were to put any more water in there you get this pressure at the base pressure equals rho gh um, in other words the height of the water is proportional to the pressure that you got there so if it gets too high it'll push out a proportion of that water until it naturally equilibrates and goes back to where it was. So it's naturally regulating itself. And what it means is you've got very good drainage through the surface, but it's near enough that you can get some roots through, grass roots through to it, so it's got a supply of moisture. And it doesn't have to get right in there. It can be above because of the capillary rise thing I was talking about as well. So it's, it is quite a complex situation for a premier pitch um, profile. Also, we for, for, for other sort of construction, we might want to be looking at how do you rapidly get water off the surface? So if you're not a premiership pitch, but you know, you're a local football club on, on a clay loam soil, um, it's a different approach. Uh, there's an effect called hydraulic draw, which we use here. So if you've got, you just have to imagine that's a pitch, not piece of guttering and a tube. But if you've got a sort of sandy layer on the top of the pitch that connects directly to sand down a trench, and you could have gravel and a pipe or whatever, as water drains through this sand, it actually creates a suction. We call it matric tension. It creates so the deeper this sand, the greater the suction at the surface. And so if you get this right, 
you can actually suck water laterally across the surface and down your down your drains. Uh, so often I see contractors putting gravel right to the surface because I think they're doing a great job, lots of lots of coarse material, and then top dress it, dress it with sand and that, sh that should fly down. It obviously doesn't because you get this hydraulic barrier because of surface tension and you've got no hydraulic draw whatsoever. Um, you have to be careful about how deep you go because if you go too deep, the suction's that great that you get something called air entry. In other words, you need a continuous chain of water filled pores to get that tension effect. Once you get a big empty one in the middle there, the chain's broken and you don't get the, the um, hydraulic draw. So again, there's quite a bit of science in, in getting this right. So thinking about that, um, a typical design for a sports fish might be this. So we have what we call the primary land drainage system, which is the piped system, if you like. Uh, so you have corrugated, perforated plastic pipes. Um, 30 years ago, these would have been clay tile pipes, we called them. They were just sort of foot long clay pipes butted up against each other. And then where they butted, that's how the water got in. Not not brilliantly efficient, but, you know, worked, worked for a couple of hundred years. So um, shouldn't diss it either, but much better with a, a corrugated perforated plastic pipe in a trench surrounded by gravel backfill. And then we'd backfill to the surface with sand and you'd have these typically between three to five meter spacing so you'd have another one up here and another and another across your pitch and then these would outfall into a collector drain and then to a point of outfall. Perpendicular to the lateral drains we'll have what we call the secondary drainage system and there, there are quite a few forms of secondary drainage but they tend to be things like sand bands or sand slits these are sort of excavated 90 degrees to the lateral drains. Some have gravel in the bottom, some are just sand, um, depending on the design. And these are the ones doing the work, really. Um, they're sort of taking the water down, and then conveying it to the lateral drains, which are really the, the plug hole, if you like. And then to finish the system, we would have a, a highly permeable layer on the surface. Uh, this one happens to be something called a root zone carpet. So a sand soil mix spread across the top there. Uh, and the great thing about that is that um, you can get instant temporary storage of rainfall. So if the heavens open, um, it's not sitting on the surface. It's actually in that root zone layer. It can then whittle its way down the secondary drainage into the primary. But also, if you don't make that too thick, you can grow your grass through the sand, which isn't particularly stable, particularly if your particles are sort of um, a bit more spheroid rather than angular. Um, and we, we do look at particle geometry as well to get it right but those roots can go through that into the indigenous soil you know if it was a clay loam soil so you get good anchorage um, so you get traction uh, you also get good nutrient and water availability you know from a clay soil so you can actually get the best of both worlds here you can get instant drainage um, traction but then nutrient and water availability uh, and we design a lot of pitches like this very successfully so just keeping half an eye on time, what I want to do now is just go to a, a typical construction project, Whitgift School. I'm actually working there at the moment on another pitch. So, but this was uh, 2020 to 2022, and we did two pitches there. Uh, this was their problem. Um, they had two pitches, very similar to this, um, overused. Uh, this was a sort of rugby training area poorly drained, but also on an excessive slope as well. Um, normally we like to keep our slopes, well, Sport England would say less than 2% across a pitch and less than one and a quarter along a pitch. So that's one thing we look at straight away when we're looking at a site. So we don't have a, a game of two hards and you sort of herring down one touchline and find yourself in the other sort of diagonal corner by the time we got there. So that, that was actually March 2020. And by the time we finished, um, that's what it looked like. Um, and that's with it being played on as well. So just going to take you through the journey of how you get from there to there. Uh, the first thing we did was um, do a level survey, looked at topography, but also geophysical survey. So we need to know levels so that we can design earthworks. And the way we did it there was with a little plastic trailer pulled by a John Deere gator um, with a GPS on the back. 
So wherever it goes, we've got topography levels. But in here, we've also got an electromagnetic inductance scanner, um, which takes a reading five times a second, actually. So um, across there, we can get a pretty good feel for how the soils are changing under us and whether or not there is any sort of piped infrastructure that we ought to know about that the school didn't know about. Otherwise, you know, you can start doing your um, earthworks and things can get very exciting very quickly if you're not careful, which um, is obviously not very popular. So those are the two images from that operation. So the coloured one here is the levels or topography survey. Basically, red is high, blue is low. Uh, so one of the two pitches I was looking at was this one here. I had to remove two cricket squares as part of that. Um, I'm actually currently working on this one here now. Um, so we'll be uh, doing that shortly. Uh, and then there's another one just down here. This is the, um, the scan image from the electromagnetic inductance geophysical survey. Uh, normally darker means wetter or more clay. Uh, so we're not bad here, um, but it is showing up you know, a pipeline of some sort there, which we did find actually. Um, it was a, an old cast iron water pipe, some inspection chambers, et cetera. So it, it's, it's a useful exercise to do. We're also interested in drainage design in terms of is the place liable to flooding or is there likely to be high groundwater? Um, so we can have a look at the Environment Agency site. Um, this is the pitch here we're looking at, and there was another little pitch there. This is the Brighton Road, and uh, I'm familiar with it. It climbs up from there, so they get um, high risk of flooding along Brighton Road, but actually we're out of that risk here, so it's um, less than one in a thousand probability so not something that I was gonna kind of really worry about one in a thousand year probability that is up here um very good idea to then get a, a spade and go and dig a few holes and find out what soils you've got and get those off to the lab so there's a couple of profiles here so we've got grass there topsoil which is in the green bit of our textural triangle sort of loamy sand which is which is good um can be prone to compaction actually um it's counterintuitive, it's not the clays that compact, it's sands. Uh, and then if you go deep enough, you start getting into chalk. Um, it's quite interesting to then look at the geology. You can go to the British Geological Survey and see what you've got down below. In fact, in this area, it was all chalk um, formed between 70, 72 million and 90 million years ago. Um, interesting, these things were running around there at the same time. So it's, it's quite interesting. Here's the school here. This would have been um, tropical sea teeming with life at the time, instead of, uh, yeah, 72 to 94 million years ago, while these things were going around scaring things before um, uh, they had their comeuppance 65 million years ago or whatever. So that's what we're left with there. Um, so the next thing to do would be to come up with a detailed specific specification of works and design for the earthworks. Um, now here we need to sort out the gradients, uh, so we need to model that. So we do 3D modelling and then the drainage design and the growing. So I won't go to any detail there, but there'll be a detailed design document and associated construction drawings, drainage designs, layouts, cross sections. So just keeping half an eye on um, the clock if i just go through a series of photographs of the um construction phase so this is starting july 21 the first thing we do is something called phrase mowing um basically it's it's like a plane um what you don't want is organic rich material being stirred into your topsoil and then for you to regrade that because you can get differential settlement as that sort of differentially breaks down so sort of fibrous stuff just just sort of touching the soil if you like or just slightly below is then uh, planed off temporarily stockpiled and then removed off site you've got to be careful with this stuff actually it's um it's light and fluffy um but it stinks to high heaven after a couple of weeks so you don't want it stockpiled you know in a residential area um had a lot of complaints from that uh, i know now to make sure it goes as far away from housing as possibly not uh, uh, and then off site so that's the phrase mowing operation. So you're trying to get a nice, clean surface to start your cultivations. So the next thing to do is to address the excess slope across the site. And for that, we, we do something called cut and fill 
remodeling. So you cut the high bits and then you use that cut material to fill the low bits. So ideally you're aiming for a balanced cut and fill. So you, you haven't got to take material off site and you haven't got to import material because it's very expensive doing that with lorry movements and everything else. So starting the cut and fill remodeling, first thing you do is strip off the topsoil and temporarily stockpile it on site. You then get a few boys toys out, um, dozers. Um, it's amazing really, um, they, they, they're, they're kind of sort of GPS laser guided. So we can often give our 3D modeling on a, on a smart stick and they can plug it in the dozer and it can adjust its blade as it goes across. It's, it's really quite fascinating. You, know, you do need to make sure you've, got, you've done your homework properly though in the office. Um, so yes, you whip, whip the topsoil off, you then regrade, remodel the subsoil. Uh, we call that a formation surface. So you get it on one nice plane of the requisite gradient. And then you start to put your topsoil back on again. So you've sort of reconstituted the site, but you've got it as a, a suitable gradient. Once you've done that, you, you then need to think about your primary drainage. So that's the pipe drainage that I was talking about, the perforated corrugated plastic pipes. Uh, so this is a, a Mastenbrook trencher there. There's a big, big machine there. It's, it, it's like a kind of chainsaw down the back there under, under, under these covers. So it can cut out your trenches. Um, it's laser graded, so you set up the laser. So it, it's following the laser, not, not the land, if you like. Um, it, the trenching arisings go off into a trailer nearby. The pipe goes down the back of the machine, and then you come back and backfill it with your gravel. So uh, these are the lateral drains going in at three meter spacing. Uh, you can see a lateral drain in there, the blue one there, uh, gravel chippings. Important to get the gravel right. Um, this is granite chippings, they're very stable. I quite often come across um, limestone chippings and they're kind of partially water soluble and then you find they cement and actually they seal as well. So you gotta, you know, you, you're really compromising the design life of your drainage system if you're using that stuff. So as consultants, we're sort of on it, um, looking out for these sorts of pitfalls. And then to the top with sand. So you can see our lateral drains here connecting to a collector drain. Uh, these are proprietary junctions, each there just being held down with some granite chippings. That's a self propelled sand hopper going down each run, just topping up with sand. And it's really important to get that sand in and compact it suitably, because uh, the last thing you want to do is for it to settle and then you've got a sort of corrugated surface. So that's the primary drainage system gone in. We then need to put the secondary drainage in. These are these kind of sand bands, sand slits going at 90 degrees. So August 21, secondary drainage going in. Um, it's a fantastic machine, actually, this one. It's um, Coralfield Top Maker. Um, it puts in three sand bands at once at, at half meter spacing, about 200 millimeters deep, eight inches in old money, 40 millimeters wide. Um, so you can see the lateral drains at three meters and then we've got the sand bands going in every half meter so very very intensive um once you've done that you then need to put your sort of root zone your permeable root zone surface on so that's exactly what's going on down here you can see the last of the sand bands being covered up uh, from the zone uh, a drone shot there um smooth round and graded once you've done that, you need to do a bit of seedbed preparation, get some fertilizer, preceding fertilizer on there, uh, and then drill it. Uh, the drilling can be done in a, a few hours. It's quite a quick operation for a, for a football pitch. So a little seed drill there. Um, type of grass seed is very important. Um, generally, we're looking at something called perennial ryegrass, um, not agricultural ryegrass. This is sort of fine leaf stuff, which um, which is hard wearing and, and drought tolerant as well. And then the final operation for this school, because they've got a bit of money, was to try and raise the amount of usage they could get typically out of a well-drained pitch from, from three to six hours a week. They wanted 15. So what they opted for was a, a, a reinforcement system called a, a stitched hybrid. So just looking at this schematic, you've got the natural grass there, but then you stitch in fibers. Uh, so they stick up 20 millimeters above the surface, but they're anchored well. 
uh, every two centimeters on a square a square grid and you you have six fibers going in there um, every two centimeters uh, so this is the sewing machine there it's a massive sewing machine with needles we had two of these going um, sort of 24 24 hours a day um, and this is a close-up you can see that the grass we see is just starting to come through and but these are the fibers the fiber reinforcement most people who see a fiber reinforced pitch won't know it's fiber re reinforced and in fact if you were to look from above it constitutes about five percent of the surface area so 95 percent is natural um, but all sort of premiership pitches will be like this there is an alternative i've just done one in the middle of regent's park which is called a carpet hybrid pitch so similar thing but it, it, it's sort of shorter pile 60 millimeters on a on a carpet backing um and you put it down and you fill it with root zone and seed it and then the roots go through the backing it's a sort of cheaper one but works very well so that's the stitching in progress so we've got, got our two machines there off to a generator you can sign you can, this is unstitched to the left so you can see the slightly sort of green tinge as the fibers are going in there and also you can just see the greeny color the hue of the grass starting to go we, we often try and see before the stitching just to buy more growing time before you get back on it i mean premier premiership clubs are, are a complete pain you know they'll they'll give you five weeks you know to to turn around seed grow it in before they want to play on it again and slide on their knees in celebration so i mean normally i'd like you know 10 10 to 12 weeks something like that um so then we go to sign off and so there's a range of what we call performance quality standard tests so we look at grass height with a prism there we look at grass cover and weed content with a quadrat we take out soil cores to look at rooting depth see how that's doing we bang in a, a double ring infiltrometer to look at how fast water moves through the surface We'd use a two meter straight edge and a, a graduated wedge to look at uniformity beneath that. If we want it less than 20 millimeters. Uh, over here, we'd look at surface hardness. This is something called a Clegg hammer. It's um, two and a quarter kilogram weight drop from 55 centimeters. It's got a, an accelerometer in there and we look at how quickly that decelerates in terms of gravities as to how, how hard that pitch is. And we look at traction. Quite proud of that. I made that on my in my workshop. It's a studded plate, six studs, weights on it, and then we put a torque wrench on it, and we pull it around and look at how many newton meters it takes to to shear the the turf. And you do all that, and you end up with oh, that in the bottom corner there. Um, so they're very pleased with that. They've done two, and I'm just about to do the third. I think looking at a clock, um, we're about on time. So very happy to take any questions. Yeah, yes, great. Cheers, Richard. There's a couple of questions in the chat. Um, I don't know if it's easy if you, if you, I don't know if you can see the chat yourself. Oh, let me have a look. Oh, yes, here's the chat. I'm chatting as a guest, it's telling me. Okay. Um, yeah. Richard Robinson, how what? How well can well constructed pit recover from flooding, especially seawater? That's a real problem. Um, the trouble with sea, you've got you've got a salt content in there, um, and the salt reacts with clays, and you get you get deflocculation. The normally clays are bonded nicely. As soon as you get you know, sodium chloride in there, they lose all that, and you get a wodge. So it's a real problem on clay soils near the sea. Uh, elsewhere you can recover it's not great because um with flood water you have a, a hell of a silt load you know we talked about these sort of intermediate particle sizes the clays are all right because they're bonded and behave the sands very soon sort of fall out of suspension but the silt can carry on and so you get a load of silt ac across the top you can recover it but you, you find you've got a higher silt content in your surface um so what you might have to do in extreme circumstances is coro off your your surface, you know, phrase mow it and and, and uh, put another sand dressing on and, and redo it that way. Uh, next so, one. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, on, on the basis of that, then um, the damage is limited to a fairly shallow depth, then you would say. 
Not really, no, because well, it, sorry. If, you've got a, if you've got a drainage system, it's gone down your drains as well. No, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's important when we design drains to put in silt traps, um, but you can't do that for every lateral. So we, we normally have them on the collector drains. They're essentially, they're an inspection chamber, but with a, with a sump. Um, because silt settles out quite quickly, um, it'll hopefully get, go through that and then settle out below before it goes through its outfall. And we advise people to clear their silt traps annually. They never do, of course, but that's, <laughs> that's the advice. Thank you very much. Thank no, you. No, you're welcome. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Mark Andrews, Richard, fantastic president. Oh, I like that. Yeah. Just checking I didn't write that. No, I didn't. No. Okay. During the construction phase, uh, do the heavy drainage machinery damage the top and subsoils? How do you mitigate this? Do the other machines avoid repetitive compaction piles? Okay. Yeah, you're right. I mean, you saw that um, Mastenbrook trencher, for example. Um, it's very important that we're using low ground pressure kit so although that's a huge lump of iron it, it's on tracks and it's actually low ground pressure uh, uh, kit uh, also for turf we don't have the sort of agricultural cleats that you'd have on a you know agricultural tire we have turf tires um, so a lot of track stuff and turf tires um, but when we're doing um, our cut and fill for example we talked about whipping the topsoil off um, and then remodeling the subsoil We'll remodel the subsoil and then we'll go through and subsoil it, um, you know, break it up. So we go through. Actually, we still use something called a McConnell shaker rater uh, quite a lot. Uh, you probably remember those from 30 years ago in agriculture. It's a sort of winged tine that vibrates. And, and, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it sort of creates cracks and fissures. So very important. So we do that and then we actually get the dozer to lightly track it again. It seems counterintuitive, but, um, you know, you, you break up that compaction, get your cracks and fissures there and then sort of consolidate it lightly before you put your topsoil back on. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay. Uh, Malcolm, yeah, is it possible to use fibre just in the high use, use zones as gold? Yes, we're doing some experiments, actually. We've got it in Regent's Park doing that at the moment. Um, the big problem is that you find injuries occur with players when there's a change in surface characteristic. So if they're suspicious of traction across a whole pitch, they're all right, but if they go through a really grippy bit and then not a grippy bit, that's when they start losing their footings and doing, you know, cruciate ligaments and all that sort of thing. So um, you have to kind of blend it. Um, but certainly we've been looking at doing doing goal areas or even the 18 yard boxes all the way up the pitch down the centre. That, that's traditionally the kind of high wear area for football. Um, so, yes, but it needs care so that you don't have a, a sudden change in traction. We've got another one here, Rob Edwards. Uh, considering the number of pitches across the UK, are there any assessments being made for microplastic content contamination on hybrid pitches? Are these opportunities for bio biodegradable stitching? That's a really good question. I, I mean, microplastics are a huge thing, particularly with 3G artificial pitches. Um, I'll come back to hybrid, but certainly with artificial, now we we have to put sort of mitigation measures into the design. So. You'd need grates, uh, microplastics, anything smaller, sort of five millimetres. And the, the key thing with 3G pitches, if you're not familiar with them, they're like a carpet. You have a layer of sand in them and then you have something called SBR rubber, sort of made from tyres, recycled tyres. Makes a fantastic um, playable surface, but there are worries about migration of microplastics into the environment, quite rightly so. Um, so, yes, we'd have grates, grates and brushes. We now have to, if, if the pitch comes too near the fencing, we actually have to have sort of solid walls up to half a metre to stop, we call it splash, the splash of the rubber going through. We now have to put micro filters on the drains from 3G pitches as well to try and catch that before it goes out into the water course. Um, so, yes, uh, coming on to hybrids, um, it's, it's sort of avoided the focus up to now because it doesn't have the SBR rubber infill in it. It's... Um, it's got the um, the root zone in there. Um, but what what we're looking at at the moment is loss of fibre during renovations. With, with sports pitches, you have the whole season, um, you wear it, and then you need to reinstate it. Um, typically, for football, you'd be doing that in May. In fact, we're just coming out of doing the Premier League clubs right now. It's last day of play, you get on there, 
you um you scarify you get all the old sort of thatch out um you top the sand up uh you fertilize you overseed um for hybrid pitches sometimes you've got to really work at them quite hard to get all the organic matter out but by being aggressive you're starting to pull out fibers as well so it's the fiber content in the um renovation arisings which is the focus at the moment so um uh, yeah i hope that answers your question oh we've got another one uh, domestic gardens especially new build are often terrible oh yeah do house builders ever approach you for assistance they do but not for domestic gardens quite often they'll have a section 106 agreement or whatever and they'll be obliged to put in sports pitches and playing fields or to replace those that they're building on with equivalent or better somewhere else uh, so in those cases sport england are involved as a uh, as a as a consultee um in the planning process um and we often get involved because i've written the key documentation for sport england so they've got their natural turf sport guidance but they've also got their equivalent quality assessment procedures uh, if you're gonna um, mitigate the loss of a playing field with a new one elsewhere you have to um adhere to those that that guidance so they do it because they have to basically to get planning permission but we've never been approached um for the guard the guards unfortunately they, they tend to build their houses make their money chuck chuck any old rubbish down there and they've got a bit of soil regardless of whether it's topsoil or subsoil they put it out there and they often turf as well we we, we never recommend turfing by the way you can do it as a last resort okay next one mike whitting what what does the end user have to do to maintain the system once installed uh, i'm assuming we're talking sort of drainage systems um depends where you are um the the secondary drainage system um needs needs to have a sort of annual light annual top dressing um if you think about it you're cutting sand bands into a surface and if it's a rugby pitch you know it's got to stand up to you know scrummaging rucking mauling you know a lot of traction and smear and, and so the last thing you want is um those boots smearing the indigenous soil over the tops of the sand bands you know and i've seen secondary drainage systems be destroyed in a you know a couple of weeks if not maintained well so normally as part of the construction we'd get them to put on sand three lots of sand typically eight meters each uh, eight millimeters each time so 24 millimeters a good layer on there with worm action and other things that de degrades that and so We'd recommend you put on five millimeter dressing each year if you do typically the secondary drainage system lasts eight to ten years and so we'd also be advising um, the client to set up a sinking fund you know and put it's typically two and a half thousand a year per senior pitch so that when you get to eight to ten years you've got a pot of money to then redo the secondary drainage system the primary drainage systems typically last 25 years or more depending on your silt content and there you're just sort of looking at um dealing with silt traps annually i can't see any more at the moment yeah i think that might be uh oh there malcolm's got one last oh, malcolm yeah one. yeah okay go, one last one from malcolm and then we'll wrap it up okay uh we have pitches which were drained as agricultural land am i correct in saying as we do not cultivate each year this drainage will not work so if I understand it correctly, we've got sports pitches, which are sort of laid out on agricultural land with agricultural drainage. Um, yes, I yes. cut that really rather rapidly, but yes, they were originally drained as an agricultural contractor would drain. Yes. And I assume that unless you cultivate every year on top of the drainage, the drains are never going to work. I think you're right. I mean, the traditional agricultural draining used to be sort of three chains apart so very wide you know not not the sort of three to five meters we're looking at but then if you're on clay soils you might be mold draining across there um but it's, it's, as long as you've got enough sort of clay content to do that um but yes because you're in agriculture you're you know you really are tending to ma maintain much better soil structure you know mm -hmm. cracks fishes wormhole sort of root holes uh for obvious reasons you can't have ankle breakers across your premier pitch like that so you're relying on the primary particles and their drainage capacity so yes it's difficult with agricultural drainage um also agricultural drainage quite often wasn't put in very well you know they, they didn't really sort of 
look at um, gradients that well and quite often would do sort of strange herringbone shapes and all, all sorts like that. So difficult to then put in secondary drainage. So if we're if we're going to an agricultural site and converting it into a sports pitch, we'd start from scratch on the drainage. But um, it, it's not to say that certain soils, you know, you might be in the green area on my textual triangle, um, <laughs> you can't drain quite well anyway. We're in the red area, very clearly. The red area, okay, yes. And yes. it does mean that we need to avoid agricultural drainage cut contractors. Yes, I think that's right. Are you, are you Essex area? Something like yes, that? we are. Yes, yeah, yeah. Well, I had some very good mould drainage trials down in Essex. There's some very red areas. Yeah. Uh, mould drainage works well in agriculture and in grass. And the, the problem for um, sport, is, if you're not familiar with mould drainage, is creating a a tunnel in the soil without the pipe in clay is stable enough to to stay like that and it can stay for 10 years if you do it well uh, and then there's a crack to the surface so once it dries because of what i was saying about these layers of clay clay you know alumina silica uh they shrink on drying and then they open up these huge cracks you know so it's it, obviously for sport that can be very difficult oh got another one here that was very interesting i'll never <laughs> do a the same thing oh not a question but thank you oh you're very welcome to <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay well um we will wrap it up there richard thank you very much it was a very interesting presentation and uh yeah yeah very enjoyable and thank you very much for asking uh answering everybody's questions as well and uh taking time out your schedule to be with us it's very much appreciated um uh, i'd like to thank everyone else for joining uh live on the call uh and hope you'll join us next time uh which is the 9th of july where Dr. Mark McBride will be joining us, uh, co uh, founder and CEO of Equal Engineers, uh, who will be talking about equality, diversity and inclusion in engineering. So I uh, hope you can all join us then to hear about that area. Thank you very much. <laughs>